right, here we go. So hello everyone, my name is Megan Carter. I'm the Community Director of ESIP. Welcome to this fourth webinar in the Earth Science Information Partners Data to Action webinar series. This webinar series, which will continue through the rest of the year, follows our 2019 theme of increasing the use and value of Earth science data and information, which was one of several goals identified in ESIP's most recent strategic plan. Just a few words about ESIP. ESIP's vision is to be a leader in promoting the collection, stewardship, and reuse of earth science data, information, and knowledge that is responsive to societal needs. By connecting people across the data lifecycle and across sectors, ESIP helps people to leverage their collective expertise and technical capacity to address challenges related to the creation, management, distribution, and analysis of earth science data. For more than 20 years now, ESIP has helped members of the Earth Science Data community find each other across traditional boundaries and work together. ESIP does this by fostering rich collaborative experiences, including two annual in-person meetings, numerous community-driven virtual collaborations around common data challenges, and through seed funding to further data interoperability. ESIP is funded by NASA, NOAA, and the USGS, and currently has more than 120 partner organizations spanning the federal, private, and academic sectors, as well as many more individual participants. So just a quick note that if you're not speaking, please mute yourself. I forgot that reminder at the beginning. So today's webinar features Dr. Julie Vano, a project scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Julie's work aims to better connect climate science and the water management community and use these connections to develop innovative ways to address climate impacts on local water resources. For the past four years, Julie has helped lead a growing science to action grassroots coalition within the American Geophysical Union that is focused on fostering better engagement between scientists and decision makers. And as of this year, she is the president elect of AGU's societal impacts and policy sciences section. Julie holds an MS in land resources from the University of Wisconsin and a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Washington. Julie, we are excited to hear from you today. I will now pass the screen share to you so that you can take it away. Quick note for the attendees, we will have time for questions at the end, but you are welcome to type any questions you have into the chat box as the presentation is happening. All right. So, Julie, we are seeing just a part of your screen right now. Okay, let me try that again. Okay, sharing my screen. Uh oh. Do this one more time. We did this earlier and it worked. Yeah, it worked great. Fine. Okay, so. Okay, for some reason that's not working. Let me just share my whole screen and see if that yeah. works. All right, now you can see all my dirty laundry. <laughs> um, all right, now you can see it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me and for those listening. Um, I am today going to share a variety of different efforts that I've been a part of um, in connecting our science to action or our research to applications or getting information producers to talk to information users. And um, I think one of the ways that we often think about um, these connections is, is through bridges and um, here is um, a, a variety of different bridges. Um, there are the long expansive ones, there's the very simple ones, there's artistic futuristic ones, um, and there's also just a lot of different types of bridges. So in kind of connecting our, our science or our data to action, thinking about how do, how do we make those connections happen and, and who, is, who is a part of those connections as well. Um, so, if you look at the headlines today, um, it's, they're pretty unnerving, um, 
uh, this one, just even this this past month, um, I think there's little question that we live in an unprecedented time where choices we make are going to greatly impact future generations. And really, my motivation in this is um, we can make better choices, more resilient choices through better engagement between scientists and communities. And this visual is one of my favorites. It comes um, was given to me by David Bihar, who's from the San Francisco Public Utility Commission. Um, we've been working together for a while, and it's his way of demonstrating kind of the scientist decision maker relationship. Um, that scientists and decision makers being two very different species that coexist in the same ecosystem, but over time can develop a symbiotic relationship. And so, so kind of developing this relationship and kind of what I'm going to talk to you today is, is really this bridge um, between kind of the hydrology, climate research, and the water management community and kind of what does this bridge look like. Um, and so I've been fortunate um, to be working with a group that is focused on improving the utility of tools to support water resource planning and management. These are folks at NCAR, um, as well as folks from the Army Corps of Engineers, the University of Washington, the Bureau of Reclamation, um, and folks at NASA. And we've been working on a series of different projects that uh, I'll share with you. But the, the projects are really largely focused on building modeling tools and data sets for evaluating past events, monitoring current conditions, um, predicting conditions on a variety of different timescales, so hours to seasons in advance, and um, then looking at, um, looking at future projections, um, and all of this in support of water planning and management. And I think our current way we think about using um, climate information in water management and planning, we have kind of this chain of models where we have observations or models that downscale and go into hydrologic models and then go into stream flow routing and, and then use that to address impacts. And we're really working to build the next generation. So we're, we're looking at our meteorological forcings and instead of just a single gridded ensemble historical, a single gridded um, data set, we're looking at creating ensembles of the observed that account for some of the methodological choices that you make when you're, when you're creating a gridded data set. Um, we're looking at different ways to downscale. So um, there's a lot of different ways to do statistical rescaling, or there's limited dynamical approaches, but we're looking at um, creating um, larger ensembles using kind of quasi-dynamical circulation-based statistics. Um, we're looking at um, improving hydrologic modeling, so allowing there to be kind of more flexible modeling frameworks and, and being able to integrate a different information into the hydrologic modeling or to use different parameters and to be able to test some of the hypotheses that you you inherently have when you're selecting and using a particular hydrologic model. And so all of these tools are combined to address issues and help water managers with their planning and management. So um, systems that look at stream flow forecasting is one element, and then um, information that is used uh, looking at future climate projections. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about any of these. I'm more talking about kind of the intersection of all of these tools with, with the user communities. But I do um, kind of want to talk a little bit about one of the projects. Um, this is a NASA AIST project that's looking at climate risk in the water sector. And again, here's this another rendition of this chain of models and where you have kind of emission scenarios and you might have multiple different emission scenarios. You have multiple global climate models. Um, you have multiple initial conditions for uh, any individual global climate model. And then you have the downscaling method. You have the hydrologic model structure and hydrologic model parameter. Um, and typically, um, we combine all those and get some sort of sense of what the combined uncertainty is. And um, you'll note that often we've focused our uncertainty on the climate model aspect of, of this chain of models. And what we're working on um, with this project and some related projects is, is taking um, 
the assumptions that we're making in our downscaling and our hydrologic modeling and looking at kind of what that uncertainty space is too, to get at more of kind of what the combined uncertainty is. And some might say, oh, you're increasing the uncertainty. And what, what we would say is we're just revealing uncertainty that was already there. We just hadn't explored it yet. And so um, I think in this bridge from, from hydrology to water management, like I'm Clearly, this group is a group of researchers interested in water management application, but we want to think about kind of the other side and who are those practitioners that are interested in this climate research. And I think I'll, I'll, there's a lot of interest, and this is really kind of well illustrated by this quote um, from the American Society of Civil Engineers um, back in 2015. They, they talk about um, in their um, policy statement that engineering practices and standards associated with facilities must be revised and enhanced to address climate change to ensure they continue to provide acceptably low risk of failures in functionality, durability, and safety over their service lives. And so I think there's a lot of interest in kind of using information and there's a really a recognition that money, lives, and livelihoods are at stake. That said, if you're a water manager or planner, you have a lot on your plate. And so your one additional element is, okay, look at what climate projections mean or what is my future gonna be like? And this is a slide from Ken Nowak at Reclamation um, illustrating some of the challenges that, that um, managers at Reclamation and other water agencies might be facing. They say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna look at what climate might mean um, to the future of my water supply. And you go to something like data.gov and you search and you find um, 695 different data sets. And like, this is only 10% of your, the time of your job to look at this, like how are you supposed to know where to go? And so there's a lot of reasons why there are over 600 different ways to look at climate impacts. Um, here's just another kind of rendition of the chain of models where you have a lot of, um, uh, like you have global climate models, you might have paleoclimate data and you need to take it from the, the global to the more local and often you use these tools, but there are different global climate models, there's different emission scenarios, there's different spatial resolutions, there's different hydrology. And really, um, I think what we can say though, with all of this information out there, is there are certain models and methods that are more appropriate for certain questions. There are certain spatial and temporal scales that are more appropriate for certain questions. And if we're honest about it, some of the questions might not be possible to answer with our current knowledge. And so I think this increasingly calls for us to, to be more savvy consumers of the information um, and then to find better approaches to better manage the scientific information and then also to increasingly have appropriate guidance to help people navigate through this space. And so um, currently kind of this is maybe how you would articulate what that bridge looks like. There's water managers who are often unsure of what information to use and how to use it. And then there's scientists who are often unaware of how their information is being used. And so this is the challenge um, that uh, we've kind of taken on. And I've been spending a lot of time thinking about, okay, how do, how do, we, how do we change this? Um, Fortunately, there's a lot of guidance out there on how to navigate um, climate information, and there's increasingly more guidance. So there's there's uh, there's a lot of information, but even navigating through that space is now becoming um, a little daunting at times. Um, and so we were wondering, so what what can we add? How can we um, connect? Um, these two communities knowing that there's a lot of guidance out there and through conversations with people in the applications community and with scientists we we were kind of scoping out well what is needed what what could help and how should people be using your information and through those conversations um, especially with scientists we were 
we were asking like how should this information be used and it was really hard for them to articulate how the information should be used but it was much easier for them to articulate don't use it this way don't use it this way and so, so we started to capture those and realized um, that some of those don'ts can also be turned into do's and so we we really started um, to explore what are some of these do's and don'ts for using um, climate change information in water planning and management and we we ended up coming up with a bunch of them and so we took all of those do's and don'ts which are based on kind of what is said in the gu those guidance documents and based on kind of what we've learned in our own experiences and kind of the list has grown as we've shared shared this resource as well and we we organized it into kind of three guiding principles um, and the first is it's important to evaluate climate risk knowing that the climate is changing um, if you're not going to do anything to change that in it, in and of itself is a decision so it's important to at least acknowledge that the risk is real um, another guiding principle um, is that models can be helpful tools if used appropriately and this kind of accounts for um, which models are appropriate for what questions and um, recognizing that not all tools can be useful for a particular question and so so making sure um, if you use models to use them in the most appropriate way and then third and this one was added recently um, is the, the idea of uncertainty and that it's not just the scientist's responsibility or not just the manager's responsibility, but it's a shared responsibility. So water managers, it's their job to um, plan for the unexpected and and that's their responsibility. So they, they embrace uncertainty every day. Scientists, um, it's really um, their job to be clear about and place the uncertainties in context. Um, and so if a new study comes out, instead of just having the flashy headline, placing that study in context and what does that mean based on what we've talked about before. And so that's kind of their job and their responsibility. And so now I'm gonna just provide you a quick overview of what these do's and don'ts guidelines um, involve. And then we can, um, I'll share a few examples too. So they're organized into the three guiding principles, which, which I just shared. And then we have more specific do's and don'ts of recommendations of what you should do or what you shouldn't. And those are broken into three different categories currently. Um, there's um, study design recommendations, there's model selection recommendations, and recommendations for interpreting results. And um, the first one is, is those set of recommendations are out there, available. The model selection recommendations are, are in the works. They're being reviewed. They should be released soon. And then the interpreting results recommendations are, are kind of ones that we think are important to explore but um, haven't gone into too much detail yet. Um, and so each of these recommendations, there's an explanation for why. Um, and uh, with some quick references, there's frequently asked questions and real world examples. So this is really a place to begin to facilitate this two way conversation where where people can share kind of examples of, of what was appropriate uses or what really worked for them. Um, and then also um, an opportunity to ask questions of what should I be doing or what shouldn't I be doing? Is this appropriate? And then each of the do's and don'ts also has kind of a, a path forward. And these are really designed to be kind of searchable in a, in a clickable format where you can go and get more detail and more information as so desired. So you could just take the simple do or don't or you could dig into it more and get kind of what the current state of the literature is on all of this. Um, and then um, there's also foundations. So these are largely from the existing guidance documents. So, so there's an archive of the different guidance documents. So you can go back to the original guidance um, where the do's and don'ts emerged from. And then there's also um, in, the, in the newest version that's coming out, a, a pretty um, rigorous explanation of the key uncertainties that are part of this whole process. And so now I'm just going to give you a few quick samples of what some of the do's and don'ts are. Um, and these are particular to designing a study. 
one of the do's, do start by determining the level of detail that fits your needs and resources. And so not just kind of going to the most specific, most in your backyard data set, but really to take time and think about how much is this gonna cost? How long is it gonna take? To what extent will the analysis improve the decision? Um, can appropriate data and information be obtained? Does it already exist or is it something that's gonna to have to be created? And then who is gonna be undertaking the analysis? And so these are important additional considerations before launching into the details of a particular study. Um, along those same lines, another, another do is to understand the importance of the climate change question that you're asking in your model selection. And so here's an example of four different um, questions that different places um, throughout the West um, and, well, and in Oklahoma might be facing when thinking about water supply, stream flow timing, drought, stormwater, wastewater, like questions are very specific to a particular problem. Um, and depending on what the question is, and these questions actually come from Reclamation did, did a training on using different types of, of um, downscaling and hydrologic information and really um, the the take home here is you can use different tools but different tools work well for different questions so making sure your um, tools that you're using are fit for purpose um, and then another in this time it's a don't um, don't wait um, to decide evaluation criteria for us assessing climate impacts and so this is really um, the idea that you want to identify what it is that you're you're most interested in and kind of draw the the bull, bullseye before you start throwing the darts and so identifying what variables matter most to you at what time of year for how long um, what is the particular magnitude that's going to make you make a change in in your operations or in your decision making and and how long into the future are you interested in in evaluating kind of what the impacts are going to be what is the design life of the particular um, infrastructure that you're looking to um, modify according to what you're going to be seeing through through a climate assessment and so another kind of amalgamation of this is looking at um, this series of questions that we put together to help um, information users um, articulate what it is they're looking for and actually so I've had several opportunities to talk with water managers and asking them to fill this out and I think this helps them maybe articulate what it is they're looking for but it's also super helpful for the science community to really understand what are the questions that people really are looking for answers for and kind of help guide some of the many questions that we could ask to make sure they are questions that are relevant to, to water managers and planners. Um, and this is kind of my, my final uh, um, do that I'll share, but um, you can look at uh, um, the details more online. I'll share that um, web location shortly, but, um, but do be aware there are multiple ways to evaluate future change. So I've talked a lot about this chain of models, um, but there are a lot of other ways that people go about looking at future change, um, stochastic hydrology, um, generating synthetic time series using statistics of the past. There's paleo climate studies where you um, use tree ring reconstructions or other um, indicators that allow you to look back in time and see what was what were past climates like and use those and maybe apply a climate perturbation to those time series. And then there's also um, climate informed vulnerability analysis where you spend time exploring your vulnerabilities on, of changes in temperature and changes of precipitation, just looking at kind of how, how and where your system is vulnerable and then look at kind of what climate projections maybe say about that and then there's lots of other ways to begin to evaluate future change and depending on your question and depending on your resources um, and depending on your, how soon you need um, results you might choose, decide to choose a variety of different ways of approaching the challenge um, and so kind of the goal of this is really to facilitate 
two-way information exchange. And we started simple with note cards. These are note cards from um, asking um, the science community for feedback during the American Geophysical Union meeting a couple years ago. But we've we've gone beyond that. We now have an online platform. Um, you can see um, and link to it here. The the a web address is on, at the bottom. But just kind of in summary, these are built on previous guidance. They're intended to promote understanding and an applications framing of research, which uh, can in many ways be more useful to the people producing the information, um, just to articulate what it is they're aiming for. Um, there's also um, fostering this two-way information exchange and providing information at multiple levels so people can come to the information that fits their needs um, more quickly. Um, the, the design of these do's and don'ts is it's it's transparent and version controlled. It's on a GitHub site um, and it's intended to promote a community effort. So one of my reasons for sharing it today is I would welcome your participation in building building this research. Um, uh, version one is, is there, it's on study design and version two um, will be coming out um, in the near future. So um, we've talked a little bit about kind of this bridge. Now I wanna move to a couple other projects that I've, I've been a part of um, and looking at other places on this bridge. And so I would say on this bridge, I would identify myself as somebody who's in the research community, but really is uh, a champion for reaching out and connecting with the water management community. And I've been very fortunate to work with a group that um, is, um, in the, the management community, but reaching out um, to the research community. And um, this group is the Water Utility Climate Alliance. Um, they are 12 of the nation's largest water providers that supply drinking water for over 50 million people throughout the US. And their, their mission is to collaboratively advance water utility climate change adaptation. And they, they've done this in many ways. They, they're, they've done a lot of um, reports on how to make science more actionable, how to deal with um, a deep uncertainty, um, and how you communicate risks. And they've been doing this for 10 years now. And so that, that kind of to celebrate those 10 years and to really better share information with the larger community, they've worked on putting together um, resiliency trainings um, and because of the work that I did with the do's and don'ts, I connected with this group and I, I get to be a part of these trainings where it's actually the water utilities themselves that are coordinating these trainings and reaching out to their peers um, and really kind of providing an opportunity to talk about how do you navigate this information and then importantly, what do you do um, with this information, especially because it is so uncertain. And so what are some planning techniques that you can um, work with that are, are appropriate for kind of the, the realm of deep uncertainty? Um, another element of what they've been doing to kind of highlight what they've done over the past 10 years is putting together some best practices in climate adaptation. The goal here is to gather um, together their experiences and help to develop um, and implement climate change adaptation strategies and actions more effectively so to, to make those experiences um, available to the larger um, water utility or adaptation community. Um, and so to do that, they've put together a set of best practices that are grounded in their products and experiences and that spur uh, conversations on innovation um, again, that can cross the community. And they brought me in on this and largely it's designed very similar um, to the do's and don'ts and is very complementary, um, focusing on kind of um, creating something that um, is tiered so you can learn more information um, as you need it, um, but is, is such that um, it can, evolve with time. And it, it, we came up with this wheel of different themes of climate adaptation. And it's not just about understanding, it's about um, engaging 
and, and motivating action. It is about understanding and um, looking at your system's vulnerabilities and risks. It's also about um, planning um, and looking at multiple futures. It's about acting, so actually going and implementing the changes in assets and actions. And then importantly too, it's about sustaining it. So how do you go about monitoring conditions, um, developing funding, building capacity, and managing expectations? And uh, just a quick example of one of the best practices um, is one of the best practices is fostering relationships with the uh, climate science community. And uh, an example here is Tampa Bay Water has pri prioritized connecting with research researchers in universities across Florida. And specifically, they have continuously sponsored a PhD student to work for their utility for almost a decade. So I think it elevates a really good um, practice that allows research and practice to, to be better connected and is something that the utilities really value. They've mentioned it as one of their best adaptation practices. So um, I'm going to kind of move on to another project where it, it, it has really focused on looking at boundary organizations, so organizations that are focused on um, helping um, the research and the practice communities connect with each other, and then also social scientists who have been involved in, in this engagement space. And so, so a particular project that I've been working on that's been supported by the NOAA Sectoral Applications Research Program, it's bringing together scientists and community leaders to prepare for new risks to water across the Intermountain West, where we're focusing on small to medium-sized communities and working with those communities to identify what data is available and other resources that will help support um, their planning process, especially around water. And um, this project is, is just underway, but we're really working to connect communities together and reach out to local um, climate champions um, that we don't necessarily already know. And so to do that, we've, we've surveyed the clerk and recorder offices at um, different um, counties and cities across this region and ask them to respond to a survey and then we're following up with them and inviting them to be a part of this process to design a peer network that um, can connect um, folks in these smaller communities and help them to navigate to climate information and using um, data to help them to identify shared risks. Here's just looking at observational changes in snow decline over this region, and it, it's real. Um, over 90% of the sites measured show, show these declines. But kind of looking into the future, what sort of information is out there that can help them navigate? And uh, there's a lot of different portals. And so our goal is not to create more information, but we really want to collect what is out there. Um, that you all um, may work in this space. So if you have others, um, we'll, please let us know. Um, so far we have 30 plus climate portals um, and are trying to understand what they provide and what they don't provide re relative to the water sector user needs of these smaller communities throughout the West. And again, the opportunity is to bring together scientists and community leaders to prepare for these new risks. Um, and then finally, I want to talk a little bit about the work that I've been doing at AGU, um, which includes and is bringing in data scientists, educators, program managers, and journalists, and, and probably others. And instead of just focusing on water management, it's really focusing on both research and decision making. And so it's been tagged kind of science to action, and it's a collection of folks that are um, community scientists, or people focused on community science, citizen science, um, co-production, translational science, traditional knowledge, and just generally connecting our science with decision makers. Um, and it's to maximize the goal um, value that has to society. And the goal of the community is really to help communities thrive by increasing science engagement to improve daily life and better confront concerns posed by extreme events, climate and land cover change, and natural hazards. And this is 
I'll tell a little bit of the story behind this. And I think Emily is also on the line and she was a part of getting this going and, and growing it. And perhaps others who are part of the science to action community have joined as well. But um, at the American Geophysical Union, um, there is this growing community of science practitioners. Five years ago, I think I did a, a session on it with David Bihar, who is the person who provided um, the, the metaphor of the ox and the ox pecker. And we did a session and it was really fun. And so we decided to do it the next year. The next year we noticed there was a bunch of other sessions and um, one that Emily put on um, that were kind of along this lines of, of user engagement. And so it made us wonder like, is there, is there more? Is this a growing community? And so we actually looked at past AGU abstracts and noticed that there was certainly an uptick in the amount of abstracts on the topic. Um, but um, more importantly, we, we um, did a series of the three different sessions and we had two networking events and it was a lot of fun. And so we, we, we um, decided to do it again. And actually people were like, hey, how can we be a part of this? So the next year um, that the group grew and there was eight sessions and two networking events and we had a much more full calendar of activities and again it was really fun um, we learned a lot and and so we decided to continue to do it next the next year the next year we had 17 sessions we had four networking events we had six wor workshops and and other events such that we couldn't even fit our schedule onto a single page anymore um, and it was again really exciting and fun and learned a lot and so um, it, it continues and really the question is where does it go this next year? How many pages can we fill with sessions that are really focused on this engagement element, which I know is also um, an important element for ESIP too. And so um, if you're interested in seeing kind of the sessions that we have listed so far, um, there's a website for that. Um, but we're, we're wondering kind of how do we continue to grow and build connections with other professional societies like, like ESIP. And um, that's sort of why I got invited to give this webinar is Erin and I had a conversation about kind of a lot of the similarities between the science to action community and, and what you guys have been doing at ESIP. So I think there's a ton of things that we um, can learn from, from what you guys have been doing. And I think there's probably also a lot of good synergies. So um, uh, at last year's meeting, we also kind of took a step back and thought about what are the different focus areas to move us forward. And I won't spend a lot of time, we can um, go back and talk about this more, but um, five of the different focus areas that we highlighted um, were we need research. So what do we know about effective science to action and what do we still need to learn? There's education, so what are effective ways to learn and teach science to action? Um, measurement, how do we measure the value of this work? And importantly, how do we get those measurements to be included in kind of how we um, get evaluated and how we say something is successful to make sure that our science is reaching society? What are some metrics that we might use beyond just peer-reviewed publications? Um, and then there's practice. So how do we promote science to action and practice? What are some tips, strategies, connections, and what are some case study examples? And so we're trying to trying to grow these ideas. And then finally, um, we're thinking about our governance and what should it look like? Um, and that again, ESIP is, is a great model um, for, for how you've been able to effectively um, build networks that are rich collaborative experiences and, and so kind of learning and, and maybe collaborating in that space as well. Um, but really kind of the overarching is how do we foster and grow this in a meaningful way. And so I'm going to close because I would love to hear more from you, but um, I want to kind of leave with thinking about this bridge and asking you to think about where you are as part of this. But then also, um, a bridge is is a metaphor, and I, I do like that metaphor, obviously, um, but I think some wise colleagues of mine have got me thinking that a bridge is really clean, like it's really clear what side is, is what, and that you just need to build 
across this divide. And, and I'm not really convinced that it is that clear. Um, if you're, it's actually a lot messier than that. Um, you might not even know exactly where you should connect if you're thinking about taking your science and, and trying to make sure it's useful to society. And so the, the best way to often do that is really um, to, to draw, well, so to continue the road analogy, um, if you really want to understand how to connect, you really just have to drive there. And then if you drive there enough, <laughs> you kind of know the way. And so um, I would say maybe there's, that's what we need to do next is to build some maps so that people who are looking to provide this connection um, have maps of how you get around this very complicated and braided interactions. And this, this metaphor is really courtesy of Lawrence Friedel, who's the director of the NASA Science and Applications Program. Um, in that same week that Lawrence talked to me about, about, about these connections, um, uh, James Arnott, who's the deputy director of the Aspen Global Change Institute, posed kind of the same question as, is a bridge kind of the right metaphor to be thinking about? And his suggestion was really a braided rope um, where we're all kind of weaved together. So the people using the information, the people producing the information, and the people who are experts on the process are kind of intertwined. And through that intertwining, um, we, we have added strength and power. And I think I love that metaphor as well. So um, with that, I want to end. And um, in all of this, I would welcome your feedback and participation. I'm excited to hear from you too, um, what your thoughts are on bridges or braids. Thank you very much, Julia. That was certainly thought provoking. I think I speak on behalf of all of our participants here on the webinar today. So it's now time for some questions. Uh, so if you have questions, I think this is a small enough group that we can just unmute and speak. Um, and I guess we can start off with a question that I've received in the chat box. You're, you're also welcome to put your questions there, uh, which asks, does improving access to online data help to realize this growth in science to action activities? Um, it could, but I really do think it's, it's that paired with um, connections. And I think kind of the peer learning element of it is really important. So um, with the trainings and stuff that I've done with the Water Utility Climate Alliance, one of the nice things for them and what we hear from them is the importance of case studies. So hearing how other people have navigated this space. And if, if those case studies include, I had a really good experience of using this information online, then it's more likely to get used and that can be really helpful. But I think just thinking we're gonna put things online in an accessible format is um, maybe not the, it's helpful, but not the full answer. Does that? make sense or if you have more comments to add i'd welcome hearing them yeah absolutely does anybody else have questions you're like i said you can unmute if you'd like this is this is emily Silat glass and julie it's, it's great to hear about your other the other part of your portfolio besides the agu work um my my question is you, know, you mentioned the importance of of, of long-term relationships and, and it's something i'm certainly aware of and, and i've heard before I'm wondering if even if we decide that long term or all agree that long term relationships are really crucial to building the bridge or developing the map or braiding the rope, um, whichever <laughs> metaphor we're going to use, if there are ways to kind of kickstart those relationships to make them um, as productive as possible early on or to, or to help others enter into those types of relationships most easily so, so yeah i think i i agree i mean i think it's a long-term relationship but are there ways we can kind of leapfrog and use right. what we've learned in kind of past interactions to make the new interactions more productive and more and i think that's 
what what it comes back to is like what is the research out there that allows us to say this is an effective way to do this interaction and each interaction is certainly going to be different but i think there is some learning out there that we just haven't taken the time to sit down and reflect and think and evaluate um, what it is that made a particular project really successful and i think there's a lot of good work that is starting and certainly people are thinking about it but there's a lot that we can continue to do and actually there there's going to be a an agu survey that uh, part of the centennial there were these grants and i'm working with some people who are social scientists and uh, getting and leveraging experiences that people have had in this engagement space to get a get a feel for for what it is that made those interactions more valuable in hopes that it can provide kind of a framework for for some leapfrogging um, but i think it's also like just having peer connections and learning from each other's experiences which is one of the reasons why i get so excited about what's going on at AGU and then hearing what's going on at ESIP too. I think you guys have done this well. You've done it for a while where, where you really, so perhaps ESIP has some some suggestions for, for kind of ways to help us leapfrog. Anyone else? Hi, Julie. This Hi. Is, uh, Sarah. Hi, this is Sarah Brennan from Applied Sciences Water Resources Program at NASA. Um, and really, first of all, thanks for the presentation. I thought the way that you went about it, the metaphors, the information you provided was fantastic. Great work. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know if you knew about our Applied Sciences Western Waters Application Office that's based out at NASA's JPL. And the, ring, the reason I bring it up because, you know, a portion of your presentation was focused on the West um, and everything that you're saying about learning from each other. Um, and really, you know, uh, pinpointing the people that don't have the information that we need to get to them. Granted, you know, we focus a lot on simply NASA's data and there's a bigger picture there, but um, I was wondering if you knew of the office and if not, if there's a way that we can get connected, because I really think that we could all learn from each other. No, that's great. It's Stephanie Granger and Judy Lai, right? Great. Right. Yeah. Yep, yep. No, I we've actually um, talked with them a fair amount um, and really, um, yeah, I totally agree that there, there are these good synergies. We haven't kind of found a particular project um, yet, but I, I would love to kind of um, continue the conversation and, and bring them in. Actually, their names came up um, just in conversation a couple of days ago saying we should really um, give them an update on what we're doing um, across the West with the, the, the connecting with the smaller and medium sized communities because I think there's um, would be a lot of interest in, in learning there. So yeah, thank you yeah, for bringing that absolutely. up. And, Please and discuss with them and, and share with them again. I think they would be interested. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions out there? I have one. It's uh, a little more lighthearted, I think. Um, I wanted to ask you, Julie, about the slide with the bird on top of the ox. Uh, and you said that some are decision maker, one of them is a decision maker and the other one is a scientist. Uh, is one, which is which? <laughs> no, I, I think um, the, it's up to you. And I think that this actually has come up several times. And when we were, they said that if you look at the EOS article that that figure is actually attached to, even in um, putting together the EOS article, they wanted to specify which was which. And we really, really intentionally left that kind of up to what people, what you think. And so maybe my question would be for you, which which one do you identify with most? And um, so, I, 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 I think I think the decision makers that I've talked to um, definitely see themselves as the ox, <laughs> um, and the like scientists fluttering around um, and maybe lacking attention sometimes, but having a lot of attention other times is one of the one of the ideas that they've floated. But I would say it could really go either way. Um, um, 
if there aren't any other questions, here is a question that I have for, for you all on the phone. Um, how do we foster science to action growth in a meaningful way? Like I've given some ideas, but I would be really curious to hear in your work what, what has worked or hasn't worked. Um, this is Brian Wee and uh, Julie, thanks for your presentation. In So I'm, I'm gonna respond to your question, um, science to action, how, how do you foster that? Um, it you, you, you kind of partially alluded to, to it actually in one of your slides when you when you put up a slide and on the bottom right hand corner of the slide you had um, the US Climate Resilience Toolkit, the CRT. Mm -hmm. and, and so we've had uh, quite regular en engagement with the US CRT folks at ESA meetings. And I think the approach taken by the CRT um, really is that science to action um, strategy where the, the, the key to all that is um, giving exemplars, and I know you have exemplars mentioned in your presentation. And if you look at exemplars on how a community deals with a resilience challenge, if very importantly, your the exemplar should contain enough information for somebody reading the exemplar to trace it back to, of course, the data and the models uh, that were used to inform those decisions. And I think that is the key, is the whole, the provenance or the history of given the decision that was made or, or action plan that was formulated, how do you demonstra demonstrably justify your action plan based on data and information? So I think the, the, the key point here being that I think instead of focusing on how do you I think I think the, the our community, the ESIP community, has a fairly good grasp on you know data discovery methods. I don't think that is the central issue. I, I think the the issue is more uh, of discovering the, of help of developing the methods and techniques to discover the relevant provenance, the, the relevant linkages between data tools and decisions that map to the the problem or the action that you are interested in. So I think mm -hmm. that is the key. It's it's not, uh, again, you know, I, I think that's, uh, I, I think the, the community has a good grasp, like I said, discovery methods for data. We don't have a good uh, way for online automated discovery of uh, the relevant workflows, if you want to put it that way, that would help a decision maker or an or action oriented practitioner reach a reasonable expectation of what are the complications and what are the science and data that you need in order to accomplish mm -hmm. what you need to do. So I, 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 and I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I think there could be a lot done to, I think one of the challenges is, again, it's this question of long-term relationship because often like, what what that map looks like and where it goes is is not obvious in the first part of a project nor even when the project is kind of at its completion because it often comes along later and so we kind of miss out on kind of backtracking from okay here's a decision that was made using the information how did you get to that um, but i think that I, I think that's a great goal for kind of moving this forward is to to really identify here are some important decisions that were made um, using science to could help guide the decision how did that transpire and um, providing a pathway forward to allow that to happen more quickly again and that gets back at kind of what Emily was talking about as well for her question and just very quickly to add on to that, since you mentioned, since we have uh, folks from NASA online, you know, um, one, one, one thing, because if you are a recipient of federal funds, you know, now there is an increasing requirement to actually make your, the, the data that would generate it from those grants publicly discoverable. But, uh, you know, to, to whatever extent that we can start a conversation around having federal agencies, I know not everybody's going to like this because it's going to impose a lot more work on everybody. But to what extent can we get the federal agencies like NASA or NOAA or whoever that, that funds pro planning projects 
to 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 require recipients to uh, actually expose that traceability of decisions back to models and data in a in some manner. We don't know what manner they should really expose it. This is an open question. I don't have the answer, but that may be a requirement that the agencies maybe should talk, start talking about imposing again. It's going to receive a lot of blowback from the community because everybody else, everybody knows how hard it is to to to, to produce reports back to the federal funding agencies. You know, I I've been on on that receiving end of you know you have to submit this report this and that. But nevertheless, I think we we ought to have that uh, conversation because that might go some ways towards um, um, fostering this connection between science and actions. In, in a way that can be discoverable and and it can be shared with everybody. Yeah, I think there might also be, so last year, one of the, the science to action sessions was on kind of um, how this sort of research gets funded and what, is there different funding models that allow this um, to be more successful and hearing from some of the um, Q Charitable Trust has, um, a, a, an ocean science program that is looking at kind of what is the long-term um, impacts of projects and so there might be some ideas there to learn from and I know this year I suspect that conversation will continue there's a couple sessions that are are about that so I would recommend like checking that out and and again I think collectively we have a, a larger voice saying hey this is really important if we want our our information to be relevant to society we need to make sure we close that loop and and um, allow for for kind of this duration to be able to see what happens to our research after a grant ends and I, I mean what that actually looks like um, <laughs> we have to figure that out. But I think collectively, we maybe have experiences that can feed into what a, a model might be. Thank you. So it seems like this is a conversation that needs to continue. Unfortunately, we are running out of time in our hour. So I want to thank you, Julie. And I have just a few closing slides. Uh, before we end, I want to remind everyone that the 2019 ESIP summer meeting is just 25 days away. Uh, ESIP meetings, if you're not familiar, bring together the most innovative thinkers and leaders around Earth observation data. And a very high percentage of participants note that the meetings were important for helping them find collaborators. We have an excellent lineup of plenary speakers and a full agenda of breakout sessions that you can view online. So feel free to take a look and then see what other site events are also happening in conjunction with the meeting, including the Geosemantics Symposium, the Data to Action Teacher Workshop, and the Drone Data API Hackathon. So there are many reasons to be excited and to join if you can. There is also the possibility of remote participation if you uh, cannot make it in person. So I'm hearing that you are not seeing my slides, so give me just a moment. Sorry, everyone. How about now? Can you see my slides? Yes. yes. You see them now. All right. I apologize for that. So that was the little plug about the upcoming summer meeting. Uh, finally, I wanted to remind everyone that you can engage with ESIP in a variety of ways that I mentioned before. You can uh, come to our in-person meetings, you can join one of the numerous 20 plus virtual collaborations that we have. You can encourage your organization to become an ESIP partner. You can also find out more about ESIP at this link on the bottom right hand corner for the ESIP one pager and feel free to share this with others. The best way to stay in the know about what's happening in ESIP is to join our Monday update mailing list. You can use this link on the top right to do so, or you can simply go to the ESIP website and uh, sign up on the bottom of the page. I also want to tell you about our upcoming webinars. Because of the in-person uh, ESIP meeting in July, there will not be a Data to Action webinar next month, but don't despair. We'll be back after July with a webinar featuring, featuring highlights from the July meeting. This is something we did shortly after our, our January meeting, and it was a hit with participants because it was a fast-paced way to hear what happened through the eyes of the community members who were actually there.
So check our website for the exact details. And remember that you can access all of the webinar recordings on the ESIP YouTube channel. I also wanted to let you know that there will be a special webinar next Monday, actually this coming Monday, June 24th at 12 p.m. Eastern time, hosted by ESIP's Disaster Lifecycle Cluster. This webinar will discuss trusted federal GIS data sources for hazard response and decision making, and will feature speakers from NASA, NOAA, FEMA, and the USGS. So please join us if you can. And with that, I would like to thank our speaker, Julie, again, and thank all of you for attending. We hope to see you on the next webinar and possibly at the ESIP summer meeting. Great, thank you. Thank you, everybody.